Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barry Kostrinsky. This is ATOA, the Artist Talk on Art. ATOA has been around since 1975 with the longest running dialogue on art in New York City, actually across the country. We've always been and had a physical presence in New York City on the Lower West Side. Obviously, we're in the middle of COVID. And for the last, it's been about 74 Mondays now. I think we missed one, maybe two holidays. We've been gathering almost every week. And this is a format that we've sort of walked into. We will continue this format even once we start our live talks, which hopefully will happen now in January. Uh, originally, we were planning on doing them in October, but we pushed it back given the increase due to Delta and the variations. Um, we thank you all for coming. We're a 501c3, a nonprofit. All of our talks are free. I want to thank everybody who sent checks in or called me up and paid with credit card. We appreciate your donations. And yes, that's sort of how it keeps us going with our expenses. Um, talks to come are on our website. You could look at atoanyc.org and you can see what we have lined up. There are a lot of exciting talks coming. We do have a talk coming that actually will be on creativity and play because we have many talks with artists sharing about their art as well. So lots of fun things coming. Keep in mind, if you'd like to present something to the ATOA, we have a planning committee, a planning committee meeting that's happening on October 6th. Reach out to me, I'll give you information and you could submit any idea. And as well, you could submit any idea at any time and I'll forward it to the committee for them to look over. Um, tonight, uh, we did have a cancellation last minute. So we're going to that format that we originally started where we sort of open chair for 10 minutes or so, each of us. Um, and we're gonna use that format tonight. Um, I will say one other thing, our previous talks are on our YouTube channel. And by the way, all this is accessible through our website, atoanyc.org. And the YouTube channel has all the past talks you can take a look at your time. And of course, there's a little introduction in there as well. I wanna thank you all for coming. As I always like to say, time is our most valuable commodity and probably the hardest one to put our finger on. And if you notice from all the talks that we've had in uh, the past year and a half, and of course, if you look back at just about any talks on art, you will notice time comes up as a very important issue. If you go back to Mybridge and his studies on movement, he's one of the He's not the first, but he's somebody who puts time right in our face. And it's definitely a current theme today. Um, and I think if you look at our history of talks, all the themes that are happening in today's art world are sort of fleshed out in our talks, whether it's immigration, isolation, how you deal with COVID, artists changing, evolving and developing. There's so many great things that all of you have shared and I wanna thank you all for it that really makes it a very rich soup. Um, before we start, special occasion, one of our board members, Fran Beeler is here. Special <laughs> occasion, it's her birthday. And let's do it the way we've created a nice friendly environment. Let's sing happy birthday to Fran and get it on tape. So one, two, three, happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Take you guys on the road, I'm telling you. <laughs> A dirt road. <laughs> I was on mute. <laughs> I should have been mute singing. <laughs> oh, that's that's why we're artists talk on art and not artists sing about art. <laughs> and that's that. That's oh really my right. god! That's so happy birthday, Fran, and for everything you do, and to all the other board members who may not be here. Thank you for all your participation and all your work. Um, we're going to start with uh, Michael Cantor. Oh, sorry, I've got your name wrong, Michael. Michael Krasowitz. Uh, Michael Krasowitz has presented before, and I also want to point out, uh, Fran always helps when we have te technical difficulties, but so does Michael. He's also somebody I feel I can reach out to 
for anything I need. And I, I want to thank you, Michael, for that. And one of the great things is getting to know all you people that are here and more through this. And of course, Michael, meeting you. So thanks, Michael. And I appreciate you presenting to us tonight. So welcome. Well, thank you, Barry. And thanks to Artists Talk on Art. It's one of the things that have gotten me through COVID and inspired me to keep working along with everybody here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about just what I've been working on lately. Um, it's been a bit of a challenge to keep working and to keep motivated. Um, I don't know why it's just, I've got COVIDitis a bit, but uh, I'll show you what I've been, I've come up with lately. Oh. All right, I'm pretty sure I just hit enter, right? Yeah. So, um, so I'm a pretty prolific artist, and I don't know if you guys know, I've been working on this project where I tried to come up with a way to do an oil painting very quickly so I can use social media. So what I do is I was doing this project in last year or so, where I was doing a painting a day. So I had to kind of figure out a process where I can do an oil painting very quickly. And it's like a, almost like an oil sketch gestural kind of thing. So these are the pieces that I was working on, I'd say over the summer, just a little bit. So this was the style I was working on. I usually choose a light direction. Um, so my work is very intuitive. I, uh, I just start with brush, make a couple of marks, and then I build the painting out. I think of the painting process as a way of revealing something from my subconscious or the archetypal subconscious by pr the practice of making art on a consistent basis. If I make art on a daily basis, I feel like I'm synchronizing with my subconscious. I let the images emerge and then try to understand what it is that I'm presenting to myself and to the public. Um, Sometimes I think of it as a literal narrative. Is there a narrative that's happening in the painting? Or do I think of it as just as an experience with the paint, with the color, with the, with the kind of ambiguity of the colors interacting with each other? So let me see, I just think which I just hit enter. So these are the pieces that I, will work, I was working on over the summer a bit. Now this one here, I spent a little more time developing the idea so I had the initial sketch and I spent a little more time. No, this might have taken a week to complete. Um, so I think a lot of my work deals with family and interactions with people and compassion and how people kind of form communities in their environment. Um, it's more speculation in terms of that, but that's what I've noticed. I've noticed these figures like motherly figures and things like that. I've noticed environments and it seems almost like an agrarian society that seems to be developing. Um, this was an experiment. I just wanted to let it go a little bit. But again, that's figurative. There's a figurative abstraction going on. So there's figures that come in into reality and drift out of reality. Barry was talking a little bit about time. I'm really interested in how, um, what we rationalize in this, consciousness we think of as like a fixed timeline but i think that we also process in a way our minds process information over multiple timelines in some ways i don't know if i can explain that right so so things come into focus and come out of focus memories come into focus and they drift away and then we recombine the, the information to make new memories this kind of thing oh that's nice you know, I, I, again, I, you know, I think this idea of um, accessing this kind of introspective world, it's, it's, it's a reflection of this world, but it's also an entrance into another dimensional space. And I think of, I think of myself kind of as a tourist with a, with a snapshot camera, and I'm going into this space and I'm bringing back pictures. That, when I make a picture like this, I particularly feel that way. Like I'm entering this other dimensional space and I'm, I'm bringing back this information. I don't necessarily think of it as something that is a reflection of this physical space quite so much. 
so this is the new work. So previously that was the work I was working on. And then I got this idea recently in the last month or so of just working with flat color fields. And this, this, these next few pieces are the pieces I've been working on. I'll just, I'll just go through them and we can discuss them. I think it deals with the same subject matter. It's just a different way of kind of expressing the same ideas. So I got away from the idea of make, making three-dimensional forms. I wanted to play around with the interaction of the different color spaces and leave them in this flat field. One, one thing I've been doing with these pieces is I've been putting them on Facebook and I've been using their 3D, automatic 3D modeling program. And they've been taking these the two dimensional pieces and they've been creating these three dimensional models from, they, they, it, it's, it's guessing where the planes are and it's creating space. And what I'm thinking of doing with these pieces, just something I've been thinking about is creating uh, like a, a wood base and then building the surface up and making three three dimensional models from these pieces. But for now, this is where I'm at. Michael, I just want to read some of the comments. You're getting some very nice comments from our crowd. Um, Susan Grucci says, Michael, how wonderful. It has such a sculptural feel, feel to the third piece. And she's referring to your earlier works, obviously. Uh, Fran Beeler says, wonderful, the green tone painting that you let go looks like a face emerging from a landscape with hidden figures. And that is always a good practice. You know, we, we sort of, we all have our way when we approach painting and art. There's no question about it, even though we think maybe it's not so laid out, but it really is. And so anytime you can sort of take a divergence and try something different, it can actually be very hard to do that. Um, it, it takes a certain uh, vulnerability. Um, and so I, I, I applaud you for doing that. Um, and Fran also mentions it definitely does look like another dimension, like you're, you are sort of appearing into another world and coming back. Jenna Lash likes how you use, love the snapshot illusion, Mike. It's different than the way you've described your work in the past. And I'd agree, I, I've heard you describe your work in the past. And I know you're very interested in the evolution of the work through interaction with people who say things and the sort of whole life cycle of the work. Um, this is very different. Elaine Forrest says the colors are so vibrant and juicy. Love these new pieces. And Susan agrees, Elaine, you're so right. Uh, Fran says an interesting new direction, the flat color, color fields, very direct, strong images and actually quite the opposite of what you used to do. You would rely on your brushwork um, and you create great texture and you'd round your forms, not an in incredible depth, but in a, a depth that was palpable. And obviously here painting almost like leger in the uh, color areas, um, it, is, uh, it is very different, but your color palette, it's still totally you. You are recognizable in your colors. Uh, Nicholas Wolfson says, love these. And Eileen Hoffman, so glad to hear you talk more about your work. I like the community you talk about. You are that way with people. Very nice comment. Barbara Sherman, Michael, one of the early ones is very much like Sunday afternoon on the Grand Jet, the forms and the palette, referring to the Surat pointillist divisionalist piece. And Mark Josloff, you seem to be tuned into color temperatures to create mood and space. That's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, I do. I do work. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's very nice. Um, I do. I'm aware of, you know, color temperature and I'm I actually I try to play off of that. So I'll actually move, move, try to move some of the cooler pieces forward and some of the warmer pieces back. I try to play around with that idea that because, yeah, that this is this was a big risk. You're right. I was. Not sure how it's going to be, how it's going to play, because uh, I got rid of, you know, things that are safe in some ways. If I create, you know, perspective or depth, 
I kind of uh, know that it can, you know there's a, there's a way in for the viewer because they're looking at volume and space, and and even when I, in my old original paintings were underpainting with glazing, so I was very conscious about trying to create three dimensions. So by bringing it, making it flat, I was just ex I've been experimenting with can you still create the illusion of space, you know, using, you know, just flat fields of color. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I always think of this Addis Huxley thing, he talks about a thing called antipodes. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, you know, deconstructing ego consciousness and trying to see if art can help us be a vehicle to enter into higher states of consciousness. So, but in the antipodes idea, which is uh, his idea is that certain colors and certain metals and certain things like that react, act as triggers in our subconscious. And it, it you know, like he would say that like churches would do that. They would have certain metals and certain colors that people couldn't see. And they would come in there and, and part of the religious experience was seeing those colors and having those triggers in their subconscious. So they open with their doorways of perception. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I, my ego consciousness would like to think that if somebody sees that, somehow it triggers latent awareness of their subconscious intention or their archetypal intention. I feel like I'm running through my 10 minutes. So no, no, you feel free to keep going. We, we all have a small group presenting tonight. And, uh, you know, you started us with some light fare there, very light topics. Uh, obviously, yeah. you did it, Michael. I, I like the way you jump right into it. Um, um, I will say, you, you know, colors will push and pull different colors. It will give you different depth. So you certainly can achieve uh, three-dimensionality just by color next to color. Because, you know, they, they will have, have different, different fields that they sort of hold. Yeah, and this is this is one of the most recent ones. And this one, I intentionally went back to planes. You know, I, you know, I, I, I was working very flat, and then I part part of my process is that I get a little bored with the thing I did, but I also think, is it working? You know, is it communicating? So here, I intentionally went in with with I established certain areas with planes. So my intention. So this whole thing with intention, I think, is a really kind of interesting idea, because, you know, if my if my theory is true, I if I just make marks organically, there'll be depth. If there's going to be depth, organically, there's going to be perspective because intuitively I'll create that. And then on the opposite, it's like, should I have intention to create? Uh, perspective and then build off of that and I've always been you know in my 40 years of doing this it's always been a back and forth should I have intention or should I let the thing flow and come out so in this one I you know up in the top left corner I created a you know this space and then everything built off of these different planes and I think in a way for my, for my own analysis is yes, it, it definitely helps to do that because it gives some space and it gives some context and it helps, you know, create a framework from which the other things can emerge. So I don't know, you know, I hate saying I don't know, you know, but that's what I do. This one I thought was kind of interesting. I thought this one is like a blood vessel that somebody cut open and this it's kind of came out of that. It definitely has that feel of uh, intestines or inside a stomach, something like that. Of course, with the head smiling at you. Yeah. This is the last one I worked on. In this one, you seem to be mixing the two styles a little bit. Yeah, the funny thing about this one, this was the first one I did of the new style. I drew the head and then I, got stuck and I put it away. And then at the end of that, this series, I brought it back out and just finished, just did this one last week. I'll read a few more of the comments. Um, 
Ilse Schreibner, no, says beautiful and expressive. Alyssa Pritzker, I saw the Amazon on the green painting, very environmental feeling. Uh, Fran Beeler, I also liked what you said about the work being involved with family and community. Um, Diane Churchill, wonderful color. And Elaine Forrest asks, what sizes are these and are they on canvas? I, I can show you, let me I'll stop sharing. I'll show you one of the originals to make it easier. They're all, about, they're all about this size. They're about 20 by 24. I, I'm working on this other piece, which is like, it's gonna be a matrix of like maybe 36 paintings and they're all gonna interconnect and they're all 20 by 24. So that's everywhere over there. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. Nobody, my, my family, I keep taking them out and putting them away. But the, and then I'm working on a Tondo piece. I can show you that if, if you guys get a second. Sure. Robin Halpern says she loves the colors. Mark Josloff asks any connection to Carl Jung? Are you a fan of, I mean, you mentioned archetypal images. Have you, uh, do you read Carl Jung or you, you feel yeah. it in? This is the time, I just, uh, I'll put this back, but this is the time, this is the way I just, this is my layout, this is how I lay out a piece when I start. So I'm just starting to figure out what to do with this. Yeah, so let's see over here. That's because Jenna got me into doing circles. Um, Good influence of a fellow artist. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's really interesting, you know, Carl Jung and Addis Huxley, and I was really into reading Carlos Castaneda and anything, you know, along the lines of like, so, you know, my, the, my theory comes from the idea that I just get people. Um, when I was a kid, when I was in school, college, I, I was really interested in the idea of, you know, the conscious, the person that my identified as me, I thought, wow, that's a pretty screwed up person, you know, and I don't didn't think I was screwed up. I would just think I was a, a, a uh, an amalgamation of so many different screwed up things that that's what I was manifesting in the world, you know. So my pro my idea was, is there a way that you can re, re access that innocent self, the pure self that you know, you, you start with in childhood. So my whole process, this whole idea of automatic drawing, I took the idea of what the surrealists do were doing with automatic drawing. And I applied it to the idea that you can have, a, you can re-identify with that, your pure self, aside from the, the constructed ego consciousness, and then self-teach yourself back to healing. And self back teach the back to the idea of re identifying with yourself and living in the present and all those things. So, the whole idea, this basically what I when I started, I don't know if you guys probably know it, I used to do Chinese characters that weren't Chinese characters, they were just small compositions. And I did maybe literally 50,000 or 70,000 of these things. And I just had notebooks filled and filled with them. And what I realized one day is they were little compositions. And those characters became my early paintings and my early printmaking work. And, and that's basically what I've been doing the whole time. And it's it, because it's like, instead of being, art is always a self-reflective act, I think. But this idea that of, of the self being something that is uh, transcendent of the ego consciousness, that you can somehow access that. That's what I think Carl Jung was talking about and I think that that's what makes art so interesting is that it can be a process for anybody to find that connection. And I'm really going for my 15 minutes, <laughs> but I, I, and I think it really works for me. It's worked, you know, and, and I think that if, you know, I've become a more humble person and I've understand myself much better. And I think that when you connect with somebody through the work, you know, they are seeing their higher self in the work. So, you know, we're all doing that. Every artist does that. They make something and the best, it's not about making money. Who cares if you make money? I mean, we all care about making, but it's not about making money. It's about somebody saying, wow, you've, you've 
made me remember myself you know you've connected with me with my heart and that's such a wonderful thing or or my imagination i'm going to go make art today because you made this something that's really cool you know that's that's what i think for me that's what it's about it's not about you know money or anything it's about that kid that comes and says wow i'm not alone you know you made this thing and i connect with that that's what i think yeah i, I think what you're you're saying it's uh to simplify, it's art as enlightenment. And I think that's a concept that has been around for a long time. And, uh, you know, it applies to a lot of things. Uh, even when a parent teaches a kid, you're, you're trying to awaken something deeper than what's on the surface. And I, I think you express it very well, Michael. First, I think let's, uh, let's applaud. That was very nice, Michael. Definitely okay. awoke our intellect with that. Thank you. Mine's been a little sleepy today. There were a few other comments I do want to read. Um, let's see. Fran Beeler says uh, she loves the round format for you. And certainly round is very challenging. You know, being a painter and knowing I'm dealing with the sides and the bottoms and composition and how you work towards the edge is very tricky. And then to have a round shape, it just blows it apart. You know, I've done a few, but it's a very different game. It may not seem like it to someone who doesn't paint, but it really is a different thing. Um, Audrey Anastasi says, I see anthropomorphic or animated cubism in your work. And uh, thank you, Michael. That was really, really interesting. And you, you always bring great dialogue. I feel like you don't have to show any artwork and you can just discourse on art and we'd all be awakened and enlightened. And it, it is a nice mix. Let me ask you this, Michael, because you know, there's you in the process and you deciding, you know, do I go and work with my conscious? Do I try and open my subconscious? Um, and then there's the viewer. Um, I, I guess that's a silly question, but would you say the work is more enlightening for you or the viewer? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, for me, I don't try to rationalize it. Like, I don't think about what it is or what it means. I feel like I'm just putting it out there. Uh, my, my process is, you know, the, ra the rationalization of painting and trying to resolve the painting. And then I look at it and say, well, that's cool, but I don't think about it too much. I think maybe for, you know, my, my experience with people looking at it is they will look at it, be attracted to the color or the forms or something like that, and then try to create a narrative to it. That's just, that's my experience. But I don't know, you guys, everybody probably has some different experience. But I think it's, it's just, you know, I was going to say before, it's like, I think the limitation of the artist in some ways is that we always try to rationalize whether we, you know, if, you know, it's like the only one that doesn't, I think, rationalize is Buddha because he's, the, you know, Buddha is in the moment and you're, there's no rationalization. I think the fact that we're creating something, it, it, we, we're limited by our own ability, our own desire to rationalize. One of the things I do is I'm, I like, I, I always make something symmetrical or it might not look like it, but I'm always looking for the symmetrical part, which is, you know, it's my, it's my own, I'm pushing it. I'm trying to make it into something. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I mean, I, it's go off the question, but Michael, I think all your answers are great. You never have to stay on the question by the way. Yeah. And, and, and you did, you did. It, it was a tough one. I mean, as artists, we, we obviously, we're, when we're creating, it's really just us in the creative process. And that's a really big part of art. But what are we creating? We're creating an object for others to see. So it's very complicated, um, you know, what people can get out of it. And certainly an artist gets a lot more, I think, out of their work than any viewer can. Um, but, you know, the great topics for debate. Um, yes, Audrey, I'll ask you to unmute. Oh, I got to unmute you, Audrey. There we go. 
Oops. Okay, Th thank you. So, um, Michael, you brought up uh, the issue of intentionality, and it seems like we could have like huge discussions about that. Um, you know, art that's completely preconceived before the pencil touches the paper. Um, and I, I get a really strong feeling with your work that the work speaks to you and reveals the direction and that you're kind of in a process. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe that's not your process at all, but um, it, it feels like that. There's something that's very alive about it. And I think we could have like a great discussion at some time about you know, that word that you used about intentionality and the relationship of the artist, not just to the viewer, but to the actual work itself in terms of direction. You can speak to that. How no, far off base am I? I? I agree with you. My first thing that I thought of when you said that is like, um, the way I think about consciousness, I think that we that that we have. If you think about consciousness, one consciousness being a plane, and on that plane, there's millions of choices and millions of opportunities and things that exist within that plane of consciousness. Tangential, not tangentially, but there are infinite numbers of planes that are parallel to the, the or or intersect that point, but all go in different directions. So our consciousness, where our intention, the way I understand it, our intention puts us on whatever hap that plane of opportunities, which I guess they call karma. Ha it puts us on those planes of opportunities and it puts us in a different sphere of experience in, in the world and what we experience and what comes to us and what we're able to put into the world. So the way I see intentionality, intentionality is our choice of how we want to exist within these, this infinite plane of consciousness. So I mean, I'll tell you a story. When, when I was in college, we did the I Ching. You guys know the I Ching? So you ask a question and you throw the, you do a series of, of, of chance experiences. And I think of chance as, um, I don't think there is chance. I think we do like, all right, this is another, just off it. When we play the game of chance, we say seven and 11 wins or whatever happens to be. So when we play the game of chance, we play the game with the rules that seven or 11 wins and that two or three is bad. But in a different context, two or three is fine if you don't have the rules where seven and 11 wins, right? So that's what I mean about different ideas of what consciousness is. So you do this thing and you ask a question and then it brings you to a page and you read the page and it gives you information, which can help you determine your path, make your decision, whatever happens to be. So when I was a kid, I got this idea that I wouldn't ask a question, right? I would just do the act without asking the question ahead of time and let the thing itself, let that thing tell me where I'm supposed to go. And that, and that was what, that was the process I used. And that's what I kind of do with the art. It's this idea that the intention is, it's in the art, it's like Carl Jung, the intention is already there. We just have to allow the intention to manifest itself. And I'm not saying that's right for everybody. It's just what I do. And everybody, there's amazing work being done by so many different intentions. My intention was to have no intention, which can be argued is an intention. So... <laughs> I'll stop there. Can I can I uh, ask Barry to ask the question again? I'm sort of curious how you asked the question because I wanted to make a comment about intentionality as well. Oh, I think that question was uh, Audrey. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. No, before Audrey, you asked the question, Barry. You started this whole intentionality uh, uh, path we are now walking down. And, and the viewer versus the, the artist's intentionality. And I think it, my comment is that it's, it's presumptuous to even think that we have any kind of control or what, what the viewer is going to get out of a piece of art that we're making. I mean, it's all really about the artist and their own intentionality. And then whatever comes, you, every person brings their own 
uh, experiences their own intentionality when they come to look at a work and so how they're going to experience it. I mean, I don't even understand how we can even think that we could control or have any understanding of what we think somebody wants to get out of a piece of work. I guess it's my thought. <laughs> yeah, but I think when Michael hit on it, certain colors have certain impacts. And, uh, it, you know, we made reference to Seurat earlier and the, the post-impressionists were working with a doctor at the time. And it was very much a science that they were developing of what each color and how it affects you. I mean, all I can remember is blue is sad kind of thing. I, I couldn't really tell you anything else about it. Obviously, yellow and red or happy or bright. But the point is there, there may be underneath it all these ties that we all sense. And so when Michael or any artist does something, somehow we get some universal, if we can receive it or not, of course, mm -hmm. if we're open, or are we looking with eyes wide shut? Are we closed eyes and we're not seeing? And unfortunately, most of the time we're not. And I think art sort of, you know, snaps us out of that. It sort of makes us, and just look at the act of going to a museum. It's quite bizarre when you think of it. The people don't walk at the same pace when they walk anywhere else. They don't talk in the same voice and they hardly speak. It like creates a meditative space to begin with. And it, it sort of, you know, a, a presence is sort of entered. Now I like to do the opposite. I like to talk and engage people at museums just because it's the opposite of what's going on. <laughs> but uh, it, there is something to it, it being a holy space. You know, you could put a frame and have nothing in it and it's gonna grab our attention. And many artists have done that. Yes, Mark. Yeah, uh, on the subject of intentionality, I was just writing uh, an essay before about something that I'm very curious about all the time. And that's the fact that we all walk in the same space, but we're entirely different according to our experiences, our genes. It's as though we're planets in the solar system. And each planet is separate, even though we all go around the sun. We each have our own gravitational pull, this and that. And artists to me are like planets too. There's no way that you can be the same as another artist. You have to understand your properties, your characteristics, and nobody can get in your head. They can't experience life the way you did. Neither can you do that with them. So to try to please each other is almost futile. Uh, there can be overlaps, of course, which is, something that will happen. People will overlap with your intention or your way of seeing or feeling, but you can never be matched up identically. I also want to say that uh, there is an intention, intellectual intention, and also subconscious or more like no, not intellectual. You know, some artists, may work more with an idea and the intellect and other artists may work with the subconscious or, you know, more, I will say with the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, no, because the intellect is not with the heart, but I'm saying like no planning intellectually. I, I see these two big kind of paths and they are very interesting both, but I also want to point that. Very nice. Um, we're going to move on. Thank you, Michael, to uh, Elaine Weinstein Forrest. Thank you again, Michael, for your thoughts. And everybody, very nice dialogue. Uh, obviously, a lot to unpack. Um, Elaine, do you feel uh, ready to share? Okay, I do. I, you know, I came to this just at the last minute, of course, so... I put this on, let's see. Are you seeing that? Uh, but you had time to do your hair and your lipstick and put on a nice dress. <laughs> oh, no, no. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> it, you know, I put it in a ponytail because it's, it's up. You, so look, I, you look great. I, I just put a few pieces together, okay? okay. And um, let's see, can I get it bigger? Mm. Slideshow, how's that? Well, I just took these, I'm in a show at the uh, First Presbyterian Church. And uh, is, Michael, can I make that bigger some way? And I put it, I did put this on a PowerPoint, but yeah. <coughs> well, I- I'm sorry. 
Can you see it? I can see it. Um, it seems like an okay oh. size. It is small. Elaine. Yes. Oh, Elaine, if you go up to um, the home tab, yeah, is there, um, oh. I'm not sure yeah. where it, uh, oh. oh, so you know what? See what happens if you like double click maybe on the first image to get the screen, the slideshow to actually play. What? Well, up on number, yeah, up there at number one. If you double click on it, will that, or under slideshow at the top. I did actually go to slideshow. Yeah, I'm on um, slideshow. I, you know, know, is there a drop down? Hmm. Does it say play? Oh, I see. Play from, from, play from start. There you go. <laughs> Ah, beautiful. Okay, so um, uh, th th this piece is hanging in the first Presbyterian church. And it was chosen because I did, it's considered a large and small, this is the artist practice. So this piece is maybe 40 inches by, I don't know, 50 inches or some. It's pretty big, it's framed. And so this was the first first piece, but for the smaller piece, it was a small watercolor and maybe that's six inches by eight inches. It was my first concept on those brushes, which I really liked. So that is now in the church. Um, let's see. I, I just showed this piece at a gallery called Art at One. And my large piece is actually in the 9-11 Museum. But I had Memorial Museum, but I had saved a lot of paper. And I was cleaning out the studio and I decided to use it um, to make a collage. Um, Elaine, yeah. can I just interrupt to say that um, didn't you save that paper from 9 11 because you lived down there and you yeah. saw what was happening and all the papers fell on your balcony, right? Yeah, well, yes. But um, these are from the New York Times mainly. The only paper, oh, you told me to, let's see if I can do that again, Fran, I'm sorry. No, um, that's I just good, yeah. Play from current slide, the second choice, play from current slide. Go, okay. Yeah, good. Okay, I wish it was larger. Um, the only paper that I had used most of the paper from 9-11 that landed on my deck in the large piece, but there are a few fragments here that actually, and this is a handwritten note that came from the World Trade Center. These pieces also came from the World Trade Center. Um, and it's called A Nation Challenged. And I added these masks because this is where we are now with COVID, but it was really how we were living at that time when you lived downtown, people were wearing masks and covering their face because of the quality of the air. Okay. Okay. And this is something I just put together. I have done several box sculptures. I take cardboard boxes and I reassemble them and they make me happy. Okay. I like the colors. And these were candy boxes. Um, these actually were boxes that a comb came in, Hermes. And I sort of reconstructed and, and did this, and also if. So I, I was using at the time a perfume called If that I had found on the street and I liked the scent and I looked it up on Amazon and I bought it. And so I have several boxes that say If. Then I did this large collage and I use the concept of if, because it really is a loaded thing, like if what, you know? Where are we going? What are we doing? If this happens, what happens? And um, the, I like the colors. And um, for me, you know, it was my response to that particular page. I don't know that there's anything subconscious about it, uh, except that I like the energy. To me, sometimes when I'm working, it's like, jazz. It's like I'm putting the pieces together and I want to have a certain rhythm to the piece. And okay. I mean, you, you could say, Elaine, there's a 
no subconscious to it or it's all subconscious. Well, maybe it is all subconscious. Um, this is a, a, a record album that was vinyl when I was a kid that I had it, you know, paper, uh, The Lady in Blue. Uh, and um, I sort of use that to collage on and uh, photographs of ram's heads. I had paper that I had gotten at, oh, I've forgotten the name. What is uh, that wonderful Chinese shop that was in Soho? That's a question. I'm not sure, I can't uh, yeah, Pearl River. Pearl River. Pearl River. They had all these wonderful pieces of paper that were printed, so, so I sort of used that. And to me, that's that's a drawing unto itself, you know, sort of complete. Let's see what else. And, no, uh, Elaine, I like how you sort of apologetically said the work makes me happy, almost as if it's a bad thing. And uh, Susan uh, Grucci says, Elaine, your work makes me happy too when I see it. And I don't think there's anything wrong. You know, we, I think we're, we we sort of have this obsession that art has to be tragic and, you know, there's a lot of impressionists and post-impressionists and work by Van Gogh that are quite happy. And certainly the history of art is filled with that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's to be seven. Um, these poles, which sort of stick out are actually hangers, you know, that come from the cleaner and they have the cardboard, sort of painted those. Um, I did this years ago, maybe six years ago, and I just took it out and and I, I had it in my studio and it was covered. Actually held up quite well, I must say, because it looked pretty clean that I had covered it. Um, but I saw each area as a separate drawing. I think that's really it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll uh, stop the screen share. <coughs> Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Very nice. I do want to read a comment or two. Uh, Jenna Lash says, uh, your work is bright, well-designed and fun, but has a subtle depth. And obviously those pieces with the papers and the objects, you know, related to 9-11, you know, spell that out. Fran Beeler says, I love your use of 2D and 3D collage. How do you give new life in your work to recycle things? boxes, albums, 9-11 papers, advertising, packaging. And it makes such a comment on our culture and society, but in a vibrant, upbeat way. Thank you, um, Fran. And happy birthday. Very nice. Um, I do want to ask, uh, uh, I do want to move on to Ilsa Schreibner now. Ilsa, you feel ready to present? Sure, sure. Excellent. So I just uh, go to share screen, okay? Okay. Oh, oops, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't want to show all these pictures, but uh, so maybe I leave it like this. Is it big enough? Can you see it well enough? Yeah. It works. It works yeah. for me. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, this is a series of works I just uh, doing. I have an exhibition coming up in yeah. big, big New York, and I call it. Uh, actually, the show has the title. I have no idea what I'm doing, but which is not true anymore because when I started, I really didn't know what I wanted to talk about. Okay. Okay. My work all, always has dealt over all these years, either with uh, the disasters of war, uh, with the tragedy of war. In the last years, a lot about immigration. Some of my old work, a lot about the immigrants, and that's still a lot of issues I'm dealing with. And this time, uh, and also environmental issues. So this, this series of works, which I want to show, is called Nature, Beauty, and Destruction. I want to show not just the tragedy, what, what happens to nature, what we do to nature, what nature does to itself. I want to also show the beauty of nature. So I try to juxtapose those two things. Now this, uh, um, I made a few pictures. This is my studio. Um, and I make, I'm, I'm basically, uh, I studied printmaking 
and painting as a major, a minor, a minor, yes. And then I did bookmaking. So for me, woodcuts, artist books, and painting all go together. So when I do a series of works, it the painting will get a book with it because I feel in a book you can turn the pages and it gives something to the painting which I can't do with the painting. So the book gives a different insight into what I want to say. It's not always with words, it's sometimes a wordless book like the painting. And then I do woodcuts a lot too, but lately I have done more paintings and books than woodcuts. Um, so this is a, the new work I'm doing and I made a few pictures of this. This series, these are two paintings which I did on um, blinds, which you hang on your window. I found an old one, one broke in my house. So I thought, and I feel it also has a very great symbolism because the blind is like, you put it down, you protect yourself from the burning sun, like protecting ourselves, what could happen to us from outside. And uh, the, the blind on the left is actually, will have a little installation on the bottom. It's more the happy one, happier blind and the other one on the other side, you can't see the text. It's, it's called sun over arid land. And the little bowls go in front of the beautiful sun and they're all little paper mache bowls and each bowl has a, a a text, a, a poem on it in celebration of nature. It's like, um, so, so this is to celebrate nature and to thank nature and to back nature to not to destroy us and if we don't destroy it before they do us, but it's like a give and take situation. So uh, there's another view because I, I have, it will be in window installation and these three long uh, paintings. Can you see it well, like this? Yeah? Very well. Uh, there are three paintings on paper. It's, all, it's on paper, also on blinds. And they will be hanging in front of these paintings. Uh, also a comment on trees, but I have more of that stuff. <laughs> um, this, this is... Um, also from this series, and as I told you, I always, I combine the painting with a book edit. So this painting actually has a title, um, um, what was the title of it? I can't remember. Oh yeah, Flowers Growing in Arid Land. Uh, by arid, I mean totally dried out, broken land. And the little book in front of it is, is um, it's, um, it has a poem from, uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, uh, who lived in uh, well, a couple of in 1844, and he wrote this poem, which is considered as one of the most beautiful environmental poems. It's 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 about the Bincy poplars, which were felled where he lives. They felled all the trees, and so the first stanza of this poem talks just about the cutting down of those trees. And then the second stanza is, is very beautiful about, relates so much to our time. Anyhow, this is in this little book which goes with the painting. Then as a contrast, I do work which is a little more lighthearted. This is a, this is a painting, um, it's mixed media on drop clouds, like uh, drop clouds which you use to cover your floors with linen. And it has, um, it has uh, an overlay, which I printed, I cut text out of woodcut. It's a poem by um, Walt Whitman. It starts, um, it's about nature. It's a beautiful poem, which I printed on this and it got, it's an overlay. And then there goes this book with it. It's, it's a large, a fairly large book. And it's, it's, its title is called Silent Sun. So in German, I would say Stille Sonne. <laughs> and it's uh, also canvas. And then it has some images inside um, prints I, I put in. So this is more the beauty of nature, I would say. Oh. And this is again, this is called Salit Rivers. It's a series of paintings, which also go with the book. There's an artist book also painted on canvas. It's a painted book. <clears throat> 
And I never used to do painters books that much because when I started with books, I worked with poets together. That's why I have still so much poetry in my work. And um, these poets, um, we did we did more limited edition artist books, which like the type of books Matisse did, where then you know, the pages were loose and people could just fly through it. And I did that with woodcuts and the poem of that particular poet. But I stopped doing this and did only painted books. So this is the, um, yeah, and then, <clears throat> This is the beauty of nature again. It's, um, it's I call this My Moons. Um, this was an exhibition in Berlin. And there's also this book with it. It's also called My Moons. It's also a painted book. With, uh, it has also collage in it. And it's painted on canvas, on drop clouds. The other issue, uh, subject matter I did for the environmental was Seals on trees. It, 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 this, this was called protect. It's, it's protect our trees and our forests. And it comes from an, uh, the whole series was called Save the Dream, Save the Planet. And I used the poetry of Langston Hughes's poem. You can see this picture on the left, right? The trees with the overlay. And that was is, is a painting underneath, and over it's a overlay of printed woodcuts. I cut cut out this olive wood. It's psychological soothing for me. And it's an, do I still have time? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. And I put, uh, so this poem is called Let America Be America Again. It's only two stanzas from it. And this, all these paintings are also on this very long drop cloth. Uh, they all, they, they comment on trees and all kinds of stuff, you know. Uh, protect our forest and this is a book with it. Bill, so I just want to read a few comments and then continue okay. showing us. You have more time. We only have one more presenter. Again, if anybody does want to present for five or ten minutes, just uh, message me now and I will squeeze you in because we only have one more presenter. Uh, Fran Beeler says, uh, whoops, let me get this up. Ilsa, your work is very compelling. Um, the work is very compelling and beautiful. The work is in the realm of Anselm Kiefer. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I love that guy, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. Very good. I'm glad Fran brought him up because his name yeah. did come to mind. He integrates poetry and just about everything into some of his works. Uh, but yours are more optimistic and beautiful, is what uh, Fran says. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, Elaine Farr says the books are so textural, it calls one to want to open them, beautiful. And it's interesting, Ilsa, how you point out that the book actually works better for you because you can flip through and sort of see things compacted together in the same way when an artist has a show and all of a sudden you see your work up on a wall and all the works are next to each other. We rarely see that. And that helps you sort of get the whole picture of your work. Likewise, yeah. putting it into a book condenses that. And Keep in mind, there's that book fair in New York City um, where, you know, they show people doing book arts like Matisse did and very creative people and what they do with books. You'd seem to fit right in there. Um, yeah, it's a very, but the book art has gone in a total direction of its own nowadays. I personally stick just to the very simple um, uh, co codex binding, which is is our our regular our books are codex bindings, and I like and I leave it open in the back, you know, so you it gives a little bit raw feeling. I use a lot of texture and like what you see here on that cloth is a woodcut. I, I mix it up with woodcuts. Okay. And yeah, this is this book, and to the same series belongs an installation. Uh, which was outside at the Unison Art Center. It also has, is, it's, everything is called, um, what was, this whole thing is about the forest and the trees and saves the trees, saves the forest. And this was outside and what I did, I have those tree trunks, I arranged them in a circle in the center is a little tree which is alive. Uh, so which other words, these trees are, going to decompose totally and in the middle is life and then I carved I burned actually with a burning tool also poetry about trees uh, about um, 
trees because a lot of poets have written beautiful about trees. Hermann Hesse, I don't know if you're familiar with the German writer, he has written a whole book about the uh, importance of trees and he calls them the, the trees are sanctuaries because they mean so much to us. If you go in the woods, I feel trees give you some beautiful feeling. So well, this certainly the, the Japanese culture has a much deeper understanding of trees than we do and they value it in many ways. And in fact, when they go for walks in the woods, they call it forest bathing. Yes. Forest what? Forest bathing, as if they're bathing oh. in oh, nature. Okay. And it's just a beautiful concept, so different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just, just the label, so different from how we say we go for a walk in the woods. Yeah, yeah it's so beautiful. Uh, Susan he... Grucci says stunning pieces. Um, Jenna Lash, your painted books are inspiring me to do that with my poetry. And maybe at times that's the best thing we can do. We can inspire each other and sort of offer elements that we uh, add into our art. Babs Reingold says, great piece with the book and painting. Um, and also reminds her of Ansel Kiefer. He has all those pieces with the sunflowers in them too. Um, yeah, I went, I went to France just the year before COVID and it's so amazing. There are fields and fields of sunflowers. It's just in Kiefer's, like in Kiefer's painting, but most of them are already, it depends what time of the year will come. They're brown, you know, they're incredibly beautiful. I mean, it's incredibly beautiful. I got hooked to sunflowers since then. I did know. Let me show a few more or should I quit? Is I, it... I'll, read, I'll read a comment or two and then yes, uh, oh, show okay. us a few more. Um, Marcia Annenberg, love the blend, love your blend of poetry and painting. So mm -hmm. meaningful and deep, passionate brushstrokes. Yes. Um, Alyssa yeah. Pritzker, your books are exquisite and meaningful. I met some of them in person, and I like how Alyssa refers to them as people and not objects in a way. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. That's nice. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Robin Halpern says, I like the way you integrate nature, the environment, and your art. Your colors and lines are a good fit with nature's shapes, colors, and lines. And Wendy List points out the tree paintings are so well suited for that space. That was that space that you had that was round, and the paintings were next to windows, next to paintings. Yes, a, oh, it, was really, a it was a great space, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that was a great installation for that. Mm -hmm. um, show us one or two more, and then we're gonna move to uh, uh, Nicholas Wolfson, who presents yeah. us next. Uh, I just maybe show you the newest, what I'm working on. I can, I ask, can I ask one you more to book. repeat uh, This is called Sunflower Road. Ilsa, let me have Babs ask a question. Oh, Babs, sorry. Go ahead. I just want you to repeat the name of the German poet, uh, or you can write it in there uh, in the chat or something. And because you and uh, you, you mentioned and also bury you with the the uh, poet uh, and the German. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm confusing them now. But I also work with trees and the environment, and I. I'm curious about the German poet that you mentioned. And yeah, also well, actually, he wrote a little book, and I, I don't. I think you can get online the English translation. Uh, his name is Hermann Hesse. Hesse, H E S S E. Okay. And he's written a lot of lot of books, but this is on trees, and he 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 said it's it's his notes and ideas on trees. If you punch it into um, Mm -hmm. the internet and ask Hesse on trees, you will find something because he wrote this beautiful little book and he calls trees a sanctuary. So it's more like, it's not really poetry. Uh, yeah, it's poetry, but it's more like um, a talk, uh, like if you talk, it's a talk, po spoken poem. There's another title for them. It's more like, um, oh, well, it doesn't matter, but it's very, very beautiful. Yeah. Herman Hesse's Hess is mostly known for Siddhartha, his great book about uh, the life of the Buddha. Uh, so yes, a yes. Great, great read. One of those reads you do at age 16 to 18, yeah. a very influential yeah. book. 
yeah, he's wonderful. I show you former slides and then I stop. Um, this is, is a book also fairly new. It's called Sunflower Route. And it goes with this and a series of paintings. This is a woodcut painted on a painted um, canvas. And the reason for this is I called it Sunflower Route and it has a subtitle which says, let us plant sunflowers instead of building fences. And that is definitely for a comment on the immigrations, because I mean, I find it so tragic, especially now with Haiti, all those immigrants, but this was already before that under Trump and everywhere, you know. So this is the sunflower route and this is also two woodcuts that go with that series, um, which actually called the scream. And the last one is a book I just am working on still. It's, it's called Stones. And it's based on uh, Pablo Neruda's um, series called The Stones of Chile. And it has, um, it's, it's um, I'm just, I just finished it. It's not totally finished, but it, I really call it Stones are History. So this is about, I think all, and the, it goes with a series of um, uh, paintings on paper. So this is all I should show you today. <laughs> That's long enough, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Beautiful presentation. Beautiful. Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Um, I'm going to move on to Nicholas Wolfson. Nicholas, sort of new to our group. Thanks for joining us. Um, welcome, Nicholas. Where are you coming in from? Uh, Manhattan. Where's that? <laughs> right here in Manhattan. I'm trying to figure out how to, uh, how do I do screen share? Oh, here we go. Uh, okay. Like a um, professional, Nicholas. Yeah, pretty good. So I am, um, I, I, the reason that I'm here tonight, I, I didn't even know that this existed until um, my friend Monroe suggested that I come and practice talking about my paintings because I never talk about them. Um, I don't, uh, they, they are kind of a uh, meditative practice that instead of uh, sitting and uh, you know, looking at my third eye, I'm sitting and actively meditating while putting um, uh, 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 things on on uh, on a panel or on a piece of canvas. And um, so, uh, when they're finished, I then kind of fish around for a title, and. Um, and I find that the title really leads people to interpret what's going on in a certain way. And if I didn't like making titles so much um, and changing them all the time, I would uh, probably leave them all untitled so that people can just go in there and uh, determine for themselves what that is and where does it take you. Um, I had actually uh, it, it was sort of shocked to discover abstraction since I hadn't ever done abstract painting before the COVID uh, pandemic uh, came upon us. And so um, I was, it, and for, as for a lot of people, the, the pandemic put me through a lot of spaces and I was pretty astonished to, as to what was coming out during my meditations. Um, for the meditators, you know about the drunken monkey, which is the voice that you hear in your head when you claim you're not hearing anything in your head. And um, that voice was, was speaking loudly and in strange tongues to me and I was wondering what was coming out on the canvas. I was rather shocked. And, uh, but it then occurred to me that this was a president 
coming apart. And so I named it A President Comes Apart. Now, I don't know if I can get this thing to go. Oh, I don't want that one. Nicholas, let me ask you, I mean, it, it, when you yeah. meditate, it's, it's hard enough to stay focused, to like let go of yourself and, you know, be empty. And yet, yeah, I sense you're, you're saying you're actually trying to paint. And we all know painting is meditative. It, it right. puts you in a zone. But how do you, how do you sort of try and bring the emptiness of meditation to the creation of a painting? I think it's kind of like people who have been runners in their day and there is a kind of anticipation that builds up during the day. And then when you're ready to go for your afternoon run, you kind of get into that space, especially if you run some distance. And so for me, it's, a welcome relief to sit down at the easel every evening uh, during the, the worst part of the pandemic as it began. Um, I uh, was relieved to go into the sort of the sanctuary of painting. And I, and I was very into like, I don't care what comes out. I just really want to do this thing. I just want to do the practice. Uh, this was another they they that they came out monochromatic or you know black and white was a, another revelation for me, seeming to it had never happened before, and it was uh, I attributed it to the COVID uh, crisis, and so I've called all the black and white ones are the COVID paintings. And then you can see as we move further on that they start having color in them. This one started to have a little green in it as if something was, something hopeful was emerging. Because if you remember, there were two crises going on at once. There was the political crisis in America and around the world, and there was the the health crisis, and so it was really wonderful when something green started coming up, and then it kind of turned to gold. Um, and again, it, it was a mystery. It looked very metallic, and very kind of. Uh, I don't know, Greco, Roman, African. I didn't know what was going on. I, I was again surprised by this, but I was made happy by that it was now, at least it had a glow to it and color. Nicholas, are, are you familiar with Metropolis, the film by Fritz Lang? No. It's, it, your work looks like it could be in the film. And I wanna say it's about 1930s, 1940s, with a futuristic view, but you're going to want to see that film and some of the images. It's quite interesting how you Thank get you. there. This one is, um, I, I, there was a, I was in Puerto Rico for most of the pandemic and there was a terrific earthquake in Guanica, which was about 30 or 40 miles south of me. And a few nights after the earthquake and when news started coming out about, uh, about the earthquake, this image began, I, I mean, with the first few strokes, maybe three strokes of paint on this panel. And I then got that I was in the earthquake zone. So then again, this was, one that I could directly relate to an event. I think your whole process sort of speaks a little bit to what Michael was talking about earlier and trying, oh, to, be, yeah, trying to be intuitive, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Michael, Michael was speaking. Michael speak my language. 
Um, this is a, another one. It's uh, it's kind of uh, it's uh, it, it's so, it's somber. It's it's a it has a a somber austere feeling to it. Yet it's very lively, and that was kind of how I somehow that that phase of my COVID experience, my, I did, I never got the disease, but, but my feeling of being in a world where this was happening was, again, it came out of me. It's how I interpret this. You know, other people may have a totally different view uh, of these paintings, uh, but this is kind of how they came out of me. This is how I look at them. This one was the result of a conversation that I had with a friend of mine who claimed that he had liberated a dragon that had been trapped in the Florida Everglades for over a billion years. And he and a, a bunch of his friends had gone out and had done rituals that had released this dragon. and. Uh, so for the story, I, I, and I had the, I had, he, he, I didn't disbelieve him, but I, I asked him if I could verify this with other people who were there. And so I made some phone calls and, uh, and they allowed us to how this had really happened, that they had liberated the dragon. So this is a painting in commemoration of the liberation of the billion the dragon that was trapped for a billion years in the Florida Everglades. That's my story. Uh, I, as, as Michael was talking about uh, narratives, uh, there's an implied narrative, but I'm not sure that everybody would see it the way I did. Oh, and then, I, and I amused myself. I didn't go completely abstract. So I, uh, I amused myself with uh, a local stray cat that would come by to uh, hang out. So anybody have any questions? I'm, I've run out of things to say. Yes, your work seems operatic to me. It's so grand, you know, uh, great drama and music. And uh, I can almost hear the thunder in the background sometimes. Do you like, do you like opera by any chance? I love opera, yeah. It, it comes through. Thank you. It's really grand stuff. Good pickup, Mark. One of those pieces did almost look like musical notes as well. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. let me let me stop the screen share, and that was very nice, Nicholas. Do you ever, if you're meditating, do you have any music on, or there's nothing on when you're in the studio? Just out of curiosity. Uh, either podcasts or very heavy metal. Um. But not not what we would consider to be traditional meditative music. What kind of podcasts? Lawfare. Uh, they're pretty intellectual podcasts. Um, uh, I, you know, stay tuned with Prepahara. Yeah, I Le know that one. Legal stuff. <laughs> Yes, we have all become lawyers during this time. It's like scary. It's scary. I'm diagnosing everything. It's, uh, and I have two lawyers in the family, and this is what I listen to, those kind of crazy things in the studio too, but I think it makes your mind crazy. Uh, it doesn't seem to interfere with the, with the painting, though, for me, to, to have my mind rattled by current events or by heavy music. 
you know, the Chemical Brothers, um, it, it, it doesn't see, uh, that's not where the art's coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Van Beeler says your compositions are so bold and musical, almost very fluid and dense at the same time. Jenna Lash says we should check out Entering the Bar by Liz Lash. Um, and Audrey Anastasi asked, what was your pre-COVID art like? Uh, wow. Uh, it was totally different oh my god it was political kick those people in the ass uh unmistakable narrative great teeth Amazing. monsters uh it it was um i mean you can see some of it if you go to my website I, I haven't updated the website yet, in spite of people saying I'm going to destroy my career by keeping those things up there. Oh, there are other ways to destroy a career. Uh, well, <laughs> why, yeah, why would that destroy your career? <laughs> You'll see, you know, especially especially if uh, if we go full autocrat here, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> well, Nicholas, I think you spoke brilliantly. It's it's always good for artists mm -hmm. to come out and practice. We're, we're visual, um, even though some of our art incorporates poetry. And it is, a, it is a challenge to put into words because we're putting into colors, lines, and form. So there's not a natural translation, but it is an important practice to be able to do. And you did it very well. And whenever we do it as artists, we convey our energy. Uh, we convey where we're coming from. And thoughts are not easily laid out. So as Michael ran through a lot of thoughts, there was a lot of richness in there and there's a lot of connections, but it's mm. not a straight line mm. connection because this is not, you know, a one, two, three math proof. This is quite complicated stuff that all of us are talking about, whether it's consciousness, mm. intentionality, unconsciousness, you know, trying to reach something on another plane, as Michael mentioned. Um, we had a few more artists who want to present and I sort of misjudged this. It was very nice because this, again, we had a cancellation sort of last minute. Um, and it was very nice that everybody sort of came together and we even had more presenters. It was nice to see the nice group tonight too. There were some other people who did want to present. We do this format almost every two months. So just keep a lookout for the website and the emails that we send out. By the way, if you're not on our email list, go to our website, you'll see my information there. You can send me your email and I'll put it on. There is some spot in there to actually put it on automatically. Again, we are Artists Talk on Art, the ATOA. We've been around since 1975. We appreciate everybody who comes, the regulars, the new people, um, and of course our board members who have come and uh, all the work that they do behind the scenes. I wanna recognize Roberto Bernardi who's here tonight as well. And of course, again, a happy birthday to Fran Beeler. Um, to see what's coming up, see our calendar. Um, our calendar is on the web. Again, if you want to present any ideas, uh, we have a committee meeting coming up. Reach out to me. I'll send you information. If you can't make the meeting, we can always present the ideas for you to our planning committee for future talks. It doesn't look, we're not going to be going back to live talks until January at the earliest. And it's possible it may not happen in January because we certainly want to be safe with what we do. So I, I just want to thank you all again for your time and also for your for your dialogue. It definitely was awakening for me. Um, and I, thank you all. Very nice. Thank you, Larry. Barry. Barry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. That, that was great. I enjoyed yeah, it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Really yeah. interesting uh, evening. Well, I love the way the, the bookends of Michael and Nick, they really <laughs> balanced each other on two sides. Yes. But we, all the presentations were wonderful. Thank wonderful you. evening. Thank you, Elsa. I agree. Glad to be here. Very good. It certainly raises our consciousness to a lot of things. <laughs> Hopefully, right? <laughs> I learned some things. Have a great evening, Fran. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Elsa, Elsa,